Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly intercede on behalf of all people so that you would be pleased to make your ways known to them, your saving grace to all nations. We ask your blessing on our congreg congregation, our, our denomination, and on missionaries throughout the world. We pray especially for the universal church that it may be so guided and governed by your Holy Spirit that all who profess to be and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and embrace the faith in the unity of the Spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. We commend to your fatherly goodness all those who are in any way afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or any other way. We especially pray for Pat Nemeth, who's in hospital, and for Vita Pittman, who's in hospital, and for those others known to us who have afflictions to deal with, and we thank you for the safe return, for the safe return of those whom you've healed. We ask that you comfort and relieve the ill and the afflicted according to their particular needs, giving them patience in their sufferings and the blessed deliverance out of all their afflictions. We lift up King Charles and his ministers, our people and our country, and we pray for revival in this land. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the safety of the Jews. And we pray that your spirit will open the hearts of its hearers to receive your holy gospel and write on their hearts your holy law, even as you've promised. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text this week is Acts 23, 12 to 35. Again, I think. Acts 23, 12 to 35. From the book of Acts, this is the word of the Lord. The next morning, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul the prisoner sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, threw him aside, and asked, what is it you want to tell me? He said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in an ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man and cautioned him, don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight, provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. He wrote a letter as follows, Claudius Lysias to His Excellency Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. I want to know why, why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So the soldiers, carrying out their or orders, took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day, they let the cavalry go on with them while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. 
Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in, Herod, in Herod's palace. From the book of Acts, this is the word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. When we last left Paul, and perhaps I should say when I last left Paul, because I don't know what you talked about last week, probably much the same thing, but grateful to uh, Reverend Mark DeWard for filling in, and uh, I'm sure that was, uh, was a very nice uh, experience for all. So anyway, when I last left Paul, he was confined in the fortress Antonia, the large structure in the middle of Jerusalem, which served as the barracks for the Roman garrison. It had been a time of bitter disappointment for him. Paul had come to Jerusalem hoping to improve relations between Gentile and Jewish believers. But it seems that in spite of the large gift he brought from the Gentile congregations, things were still not as he might have hoped. Though confined by the Romans, we hear of no message of encouragement and good cheer to Paul from James or the Jerusalem elder, elders. We hear of no prayer meeting, such as the prayer meeting that was held at the house of Mary, the mother of Mark. Believers had come to her house to pray fervently for Peter when he was held over for execution in a Jerusalem prison bound with chains and secured between two guards. Not only that, Paul had failed in other ways. He had compromised his witness by agreeing to participate in a blood sacrifice in the temple. He had lost his temper and self-control when struck in the mouth at the command of Ananias, the high priest. He had been unable to finish his testimony before the Jews in general at the temple or before the Sanhedrin when it was called into session because riots had broken out on both occasions. It was a dark time for Paul. He was discouraged and downcast, thinking himself a failure and possibly even a fool. He had lost heart. You know what that feels like. You've been where Paul is. You've invested yourself in something you valued highly, a relationship, a ministry, a job, or even a church, and things didn't go as planned. Perhaps circumstances seemed to come together to conspire against you. Perhaps somebody you counted on didn't come through. Perhaps you didn't handle things properly and disappointed yourself. You think you're the problem, and so carrying around a heavy burden of disappointment uh, and reproach, it weighs you down physically, so you bow your head and slump your shoulders and drag your feet when you walk. You have a heaviness in the pit of your stomach, a heaviness of heart. That's how Paul was feeling. It was a very night, dark night for him. G. Campbell Morgan wrote about it this way. Let us now look at Paul in the darkness and quietness of the night succeeding this day of strange and perplexing emotions. Let us try and get with him into the prison. The uppermost thought of his mind would inevitably be that of the disastrous failure of the day. His claim of sincerity had been insulted. His passion for righteousness had been defeated. His purpose of testimony had been frustrated. I believe there settled upon his spirit that night the sense of utter dejection. I believe he was overwhelmed with a sense of his failure in Jerusalem. I believe he was confronted with grave doubts as to the future of his ministry. But there's no light like the light that comes after a dark night. The dawn broke and the light broke in upon Paul in a wonderful way while he was yet in prison. In the midst of his distress and need, the Lord Jesus appeared to him and stood by him. He spoke a word of comfort, commanding him to be of good cheer, to take heart, because as far as the Lord was concerned, Paul had testified about him in Jerusalem. He'd done what the Lord wanted him to do, and Jesus was well pleased with his prisoner and his ministry. And even more, the Lord promised that Paul's ministry would continue in Rome. His usefulness to the master had not come to an end. There was yet more for Paul to accomplish for the glory of the Lord and the harvesting of souls. You may say, well, that's fine. The Lord came to him in his prison cell, but what about me? When is the Lord going to speak to me? Well, do you imagine he's not spoken to you? He already has, if you have ears to hear. He says, for the Son of Man came to seek 
and to save what was lost. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. The Lord has come with a message of good news, and his gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So lift up your eyes and behold the Lord of glory bending low to you in your sin and misery. Lift up your hearts to receive him with contrition and humility. Trust his promise, because the Bible tells those who believe him, he gives, you, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Paul had been blessed by a visit from the Lord. He heard wonderful words of assurance and comfort, but that did not mean that his troubles were over. The words had not assured Paul that his battles were over. They assured him that in the good fight of faith, the Lord was at his side. So we need not be surprised when we find that the very next morning a plot was hatched to take his life. From the text, the next morning the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot they went to the chief priests and elders and said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. So these men were z zealots, 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 zealots. Thank you, looking at Janet here, zealots. They were what today we would call terrorists. They were violent and secretive men, assassins, enemies of Roman occupation. They were intent upon wresting political control of Judea from Rome and returning it to the Jews. They were also, for the most part, enemies of the Sanhedrin too because they thought that the Jewish authorities were much too cozy with the Romans. In fact, when the Zealots did manage to take over Jerusalem about 10 years after this plot, the first thing they did was kill Ananias, the high priest. But for the moment, they were willing to work with the Sanhedrin and Ananias because they thought Paul, with his gospel message, was their most dangerous enemy. They took an oath not to eat or drink anything until they'd killed Paul. This oath indicates the intensity of their hatred of Paul and their determination to rid the earth of him. In this oath, they prayed to God, saying, in effect, Lord God of J Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if we eat anything before we kill Paul, let us be accursed. Take your grace from us, take your mercy from us, meet us only in judgment and wrath. If we fail to do what we have said, treat us as your enemies. The oath was a serious thing. The oath that we take in court to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth is of the same serious nature. By that oath, we beseech God, if we lie, to withdraw his grace and mercy, pour out his wrath and judgment, and send us to hell. You know the ironic blessing, the blessing that Aaron, the brother of Moses, and the high priest of Israel was given? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Think of that blessing in reverse. The Lord neither bless nor keep us. The Lord neither make his face to shine upon us nor be gracious unto us. The Lord neither lift up the light of his countenance upon us nor give us peace. So that's what we're asking if we lie under oath. And that's the same thing that these men were asking if they failed to kill Paul. So 40 men intent upon killing Paul asked the Sanhedrin to convene and send for Paul so that they could clear things up. Their excuse for the meeting was to be that in the turmoil of the previous meeting, things were left unsettled. The idea was this, while Paul was making his way through the narrow streets of Jerusalem, they would set upon him and kill him, and presumably his escort, 
their problem would be solved with no one the wiser. It didn't work out that way. Paul's nephew, a young man, was in Jerusalem. We don't know why. He may have been sent there to study, as Paul had been when he was younger. His family may have moved to Jerusalem for other reasons. He may have been there for the Pentecost celebrations, and he heard of the plot. We don't know how. Maybe he overheard somebody talking. The plot, after all, involved a lot of people, more than 40. It's hard enough for two people to keep quiet, never mind 40. Perhaps this young man had connections in the Sanhedrin and so was warned that a family member of his was in grave danger. But in any event, somehow he heard the news. So he went to Paul to tell him what was going on. And Paul sent him to Lysias, the commander, and the commander took steps. From the text, then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. So 470 Roman soldiers, which is about half the contingent in Jerusalem at the time, protected Paul. He was secreted out of the city under the cover of darkness. The 40 were left hungry and thirsty with their vow unfulfilled and unfulfillable. Now, I should add a word. There were provisions for breaking an oath that could be undertaken, so these men didn't starve themselves to death. They broke their vows and ended up, so to speak, without an egg on their faces. But think of it all this way. The Lord had promised that Paul would testify in Rome. And that being the case, no plans laid by men, no matter how powerful or determined, would be able to prevent Paul from going to that city to bear witness to Jesus Christ. It was God's will, and God's will is ever being done. There's a wonderful passage in Isaiah 46 that confirms this in a way that should cheer your heart. This is the word of God that came to Isaiah. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. What what I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. And if we look at the second psalm, we see what happens when worldly men set their hearts and their plans against the Lord and his purposes. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand. And the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. The Lord looks at those who oppose him and laughs. What else is there for him to do? In their vain glory and pomp and self-importance, they actually think they can battle against the sovereign, almighty, and all-knowing God who created the heavens and the earth and them too. It's just silly. Read our lesson over again and you'll find that it's hard to do so without smiling at the foolishness of men who set themselves against the providence of God Almighty. And notice this too. Think of the means that God uses to thwart the plots of his enemies. He is always using things that are in the eyes of the world as insignificant as they can be. In this case, he used Paul's nephew, a young man, perhaps as young as 13, probably that young because when he met met Lysias, the commander took him by the hand. He probably wouldn't have done that if he'd been much older. Centuries earlier, God had used a burning bush to call a shepherd out of the desert to go to Egypt to deliver his people. He used a young boy, a sling, and five small stones to kill the giant Goliath. He used a young maid from Nazareth to carry his only begotten son and bring the Redeemer into the world. He called a tax collector, a zealot, and fishermen to be his disciples, his representatives in the world. And he says to you today, if you're wondering whether or not he can use someone like you to minister in your home, or at school, or at work, or at play, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. 
But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. Yes, God can use even you. God is always using the weak because when he does it, his strength shines in their lives. It was a lesson Paul knew well through the sufferings that God had appointed for him. Here's what he wrote in his second letter to the Corinthians. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When Paul was converted some 20 years earlier, the Lord had said, This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. What Jesus had promised was coming true. Paul had gone to the Gentiles. He had suffered for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. And in the chapters ahead, he will testify before Governor Felix, Governor Festus, and King Agrippa. And after this, he will go to Rome. And this is what you're to take with you when you go to the Lord's table and when you go home. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and serve him regardless of the, the circumstances. His purposes for you will be accomplished. The day will brighten and the will of God will be done. In Christ's name, amen.